Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light and not our darkness that most brightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? Your playing small does not serve the world, and there is nothing enlightened about shrinking just so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We were all meant to shine, as children do. And it's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same thing. As we are liberated from our own fears, our mere presence automatically liberates others. Wow. That is one of my favorite poems. And uh, these powerful words by Marianne Williamson have become the motto by which I live my life. Uh, there are a lot of poems that, that are out there that are great, and, uh, and I love them all. And um, I think there's something specific about this poem, though, uh, that, that I'm really drawn to, and that has allowed me to live a, a life of, of beauty and of fullness, of richness, and of joy. So what is it about this poem? I believe that in using the teachings of those words, those powerful words, I've managed to live a life of exuberant and undeniable joy, coupled with the unmasking of an immeasurable potential for life, all embedded with this enormous capacity for joy, for peace, and for life of purpose and conviction. So the thing about this poem is that it reveals to us the most, in my, in my opinion anyway, the most detrimental thing uh, to this world, the biggest hindrance, which is fear. But it also, it also shows what, what, how to overcome this fear. And that's in, in, in the reflection of our youth and thinking about and learning from uh, those children who we often, um, at least mentally, in a way, dis disregard or discredit, undermine. And they have so much power and there's so much that they can teach us, as my story will help prove. Fear frequently defined as to be afraid of or to be scared of or to be uneasy or apprehensive about is in fact so much more. Though these words are certainly true, I think they ultimately undermine the definition um, of the word that they're trying to, uh, to define, as definitions so frequently do. You can't really define fear. Fear is, is something that manifests itself in so many different ways in our lives. Um, and I think it's something that's largely been under, underlooked. Some might view fear in its most innate form as, as a beneficial thing. Um, and I actually, I agree with this. Um, for one, we are human. Therefore, we are imperfect. We're going to feel fear. Uh, we're going to struggle, we're going to falter at times. Um, second, fear is, is somewhat of a natural guard that was provided us um, so that we can live a life free from these flagrant dangers in our lives. But the thing about fear is that it has this incredibly crippling tendency. We as citizens of this world, particularly within a Western context, too often find ourselves paralyzed by fear. And don't just assume that you're exempt, because if you're human, then I guarantee you that at some point in your life, something has been dictated by a decision surrounding fear. And I know this to be true, because in looking over my life, I spent 10 years in that stage. And I had no idea where I was. A little over two years ago, I almost took my own life. Now, pardon my blatancy, but I want us to understand just how serious this really is. In 2009 alone, 37,000, just short of 37,000 people took their own lives, succeeded in taking their own lives. Furthermore, one million people every single year in the United States make the attempt. One million people, just the mere thought of one million people feeling so depressed, feeling so down in their life because they're so controlled by fear, so lost, is painful. It's overwhelming. I lived in depression for almost a decade of my life. 
at least three of which were clinical. And keep in mind, I'm only 21 years old. That's half of my life controlled and dictated in almost all regards by fear. That's half my life dedicated or dictated by a mental state that was not my own. From cancer and divorce and evictions to homelessness and relative American poverty, my family and I have been through a lot. And though I know that this is not necessarily a unique story, unique to us, it is important to mention because it is these experiences and it is a collection of these experiences that made me hate my life at an early age. I was so dictated by fear that I hated my condition, of, or the condition I was living in. Although I did not hate my family, I frequently blamed them for the things, the misfortunes that had been brought upon in my life. I largely blamed them for the trials that we all endured. Worst of all, I hated myself in almost all regards. So much so that I isolated myself to this corner, became blindly unaware of the privileges and the blessings that I have, that we all have, that I still do, and pushed myself so far in fear that in a matter of minutes, in a matter of a few moments, my life was in a delicate balance of pills and water. And yet here I stand, two and a half years later, on the stage of TED, with a thriving nonprofit organization that works around the world with orphans, working on two books, and living a life of conviction and passion and joy. I don't say these things to, to brag, but to prove that it wasn't until I understood the power that I had to overcome these things and that I was the only one standing in my way that I could get here that it had the potential to get to this place. I was just so distracted by my own fears and my own self-pity. And that's the awful thing about fear. It manifests itself in, in so many different ways. And I have some examples here. In fear, we choose anger and hatred over joy. We reject love because we're too afraid of eventually being hurt, or even worse, we're afraid of allowing ourselves to be happy for once. We inhibit the growth in our own lives by living only in comfort because we're too afraid of submitting ourselves to what's vulnerable. We choose vengeance and resentment over forgiveness, fearing that our surrender relinquishes us or to some kind of control of another human being. We choose pride over humility, pettiness over earnestness. We choose denial over acceptance and acknowledgement. We begin to live in a state of ignorance is bliss if you will, whether or not we actually believe that statement to be true. Many young women, for example, battle with concepts of beauty, knowing but also fearing the fact that what is presented socially as beautiful is not even real. And in the meantime, missing the fact that there's so many beautiful parts to all of us, as this last talk delineated. And for the majority of young men, fear takes the form of anger, of lust, of violence, where we perpetuate these detrimental cycles of modern day culture simply because we fear the most intimate parts of ourselves. This is really about the self. The key to the world is looking into ourselves, understanding what we can do. But who can blame us? This is the way we're socialized. Our current situation, um, our current situation as, as, as a nation, as a society, as a culture, socializes us to feel this way and to believe these things to be true. But to sit here, to become aware of the power that we have, to acknowledge these things, and then not work to overcome that, that is on you. That is on the individual. Our past can inform who we are presently, but if we don't learn from our past, and if we don't make our future better, then we only have ourselves to blame for that, though other things may inform it. As William states, uh, Williamson is the, is the author of that poem that I read, and as she states, who are you not to be brilliant? gorgeous, talented, and fabulous. We were all meant to shine, and this is my favorite part, as children do. And I think that's often overlooked, but I think it's so beautiful, and I think it says a lot about the reason a lot of us are, are in this room. Rather ironically, despite the difficult life I've led, I was awakened to all this by the radiant smiles and the resilient eyes 
of the children who I admittedly, as a Westerner, expected at first to feel pity for and to change and better the lives of. But in reality, they completely flipped the script and it was the exact opposite because these kids changed my life and bettered that forever. As famously stated by UNICEF, 21,000 children die every single day from preventable causes. The key word there being preventable, things that we can change, such as clean drinking water. The things that I saw on my 2009 trip to Ghana haunted me. They had bloated bellies and uh, bloated belly buttons from hernias and, and, uh, and stomach worms from unclean drinking water, for example. Many of them had large, large, festering wounds just open on their arms and legs. Three and four-year-old children. A few of the kids even had maggots literally break through the scalp and crawl out of their heads. To see that and to see how happy those kids were despite all of that really put me in my place because all, all, of our, all of our issues are important. All the things that we've been through are important. They shouldn't isolate us from the rest of the world. We should still be able to understand that we are part of a much bigger system where we have the power to not only better our lives, but in doing so, better the world around us. It was in those smiles that even in the context of 10 years of depression, I managed to find joy, even if only for six weeks. And it was in the lessons that they taught me that I now stand here, and I, found, I find this inner peace. Here are these kids who put my issues to shame, though no one's issues are more important than anyone else's. But if we were to play the comparison, who put my issues to shame? And yet they sit there and smile. I don't know who can't be humbled by that, if only for a moment. Howard Thurman once stated, don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive and go do it because what the world needs is for people who have come alive. We are petrified. We are asleep, so numb to the world that we settle for glimpses of happiness instead of acknowledging our shortcomings, overcoming our fears, and demanding a permanent life of joy, something that cannot be stripped from us. And I don't just want to reiterate what's already been said so many times about the power we have to improve the quality of our lives and to make this world a better place, because we already know that. We already know what we have to do, yet we off, so often as a humanity fall short. I think this is because we're not focusing enough on ourselves in this, not in a selfish way, but in a way that's important to, be, to enable this capacity for change for the world. So this is not a change the world type of talk. This is a wake up type of talk. What the world needs is people who are liberated from their fears, people who care so passionately about the, uh, about the world, and it's people that they cannot sleep at night in reflecting over their faces and their smiles and their eyes. And I believe we have those people. Those people exist here in this room. It's us in various, in various ways. But we cannot stand alone and we cannot do it on our own. We need all people to overcome this fear in their lives, to put them in a place and in a position where they can join all of us so that we can better the world. but we must first enable that change within ourselves. And we must genuinely want to, because until we do, we're just kidding ourselves. But we're afraid, or perhaps we simply don't know how. We must empower each other to understand that the world can be changed, and that we, don't have the, and that we all have the potential to make that happen, and that the fate of this world must first be enabled through the liberation of one's own fears. We were all meant to shine as children do. You see, children have it all figured out. It's almost a shame that we, almost, that we have to all grow up at some point because our, our, our youthful days are often our glory years. Whether or not we know it yet, we all thrive somewhat off compassion as our next section will, will really break down and will make clear. But the brilliant thing about our youth is that among them, this compassion is so easy to find. As I mentioned, in the midst of a year or of 10 years of depression, in six weeks I found joy with these kids. And it was all, all that it required was that I gave them my time of day, that I gave them my energy, that I gave them my attention. And in, in return, they loved me unconditionally. 
If we can live our lives that way a little bit more, imagine what this world could be. Because if we're honest with ourselves, then we know that there's a whole lot that we can learn from these children. In closing, a peer of mine recently stunned me with this beautiful and overwhelming, thought-provoking quote. We were in a meeting for uh, the, the school chapter of, of my organization, and we, we share testimonies every week about how children have, have made us come to life. Uh, and it's been very eye-opening and, and a very beautiful thing. And this girl, she said, very humbly, imagine what the world would be like if we saw it through the eyes of a child. I've thought about that, I think, every single day since that moment, and I couldn't help but ponder myself. What if we all embraced and supported all human beings, regardless of their association or their orientation? What if we didn't see color or creed or socioeconomic status? What if the companionship of another human being was more important to us than what any amount of money could pay for? What if we didn't allow ourselves to be distracted or to be controlled and paralyzed by fear? What if we lived as children do? What would that mean? Marion Williamson tells us at the end of her poem, uh, my, my second favorite part, um, she says, and as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fears, our mere presence automatically liberates others. Now that mere, I actually added in myself, but I think, it's very, I think it's very important. All it is is our mere presence, and all those people around us will become better equipped and will be empowered to live a life better for themselves. And in doing so, all these things that we're worried about will take care of themselves. Let's liberate ourselves from fear, and in turn, our mere presence will become the, the change that we so passionately seek.